introduction, Richard, otherwise you'd all be looking at me thinking that Brad Pitt's let himself go. But this is an enormous pleasure. By the way, when he stands up to speak, we can all shout, where's your emu? Because he loves that. He loves that. The only man who's written a book with the word colander in the title never been known. You can't imagine the spy who came in from the colander, can you? He's unique. He's arguably the funniest man in the country. We were arguing earlier and he says he is. But... <laughs> what other ad libs? Don't forget it. He's so great he should be on prescription. Fasten your seatbelts. Roy Hart! Good afternoon. My name is Roy Hart and I'm an alcoholic. <laughs> Sorry, wrong meeting. There we are. Can I just say thank you very much to Barry for that lovely introduction. I mean, contrary to general belief, he's a very nice man. <laughs> a very, very nice, a very nice man to talk to. Mm. It's the listening that drives you clean apart. <laughs> I'm always delighted, delighted to be with you because, God bless you, Governor, all right? Worse <laughs> <laughs> than Ingram, gee, is there? Yeah. <laughs> no, I've known Richard for many, many years. In fact, we first met in the days when comedy was satire on television, the days of that was the week that was. And the first time I ever met him, we got on very well, so much so that he came with a dress. At the end of when we first met, he said, now, whenever you're passing, he said, this is where I live. He said, please do pop in, you know, and have a drink. He said, any time. And he hasn't said it today, but he said, <laughs> so I thought, fair enough, you know. And he said, now, don't worry, whatever time of day it is, he said, don't worry, because we never go to bed till late, you see. So I thought, fair enough, about three months later. Myself and my missus have been doing a gig and so late to, you know, so we come up, we're driving home and I said, this is the road where Ingrams live, she said. And she said, really? I said, yes. And I said, we ought to pop in and have a drink. She said, it's quarter past one in the morning. <laughs> I said, well, he said he doesn't go to bed till late. Worth a try, you know. So we finally went and knocked on the door. The woman answered the door. She said, yes. I said, does Richard Ingrams live here? She said, yes, bring him in and put him on the sofa. <laughs> They'll be lucky to do the same for me today. <laughs> but no, I, thought, I thought, what can I do or something? Because it's a really posh do for me, you see. Come to something else, you know, the ashtrays are not in chains or anything. It's marvelous, you know. <laughs> so I thought, well, I could, uh, you know, apart from plugging my wonderful book, you know, um, as it's nearly Christmas, I thought perhaps I could tell you a few stories about pant pantomime. You know, some stories from the wonderful book of mine, that, well, most are. But not all, the ones in the book are much better, so there wow. we are. So just taste it really. Now, pantomime, it never changes really, and I'm happy about that because I love pantomime. It's been a very important part of my life. Certain things never change in pantomime. You know, the, the goody always comes on from the right hand side, the baddie from the left, and all that sort of stuff. And some of the routines in pantomime never change. They're still doing. You know, the ghost gang, what we call the ghost gang, you know, when the ghost comes on and the comic says, now, boys and girls, you will tell me if you see him, won't you? And on it comes and he's behind you and all that. The comic looks in all the different wrong places and everything. I love all that, you see. It still works like a, like a dream. You know, and the best story about the ghost gang, oh, there she is. <laughs> She's behind you, sir. <laughs> but the best... <laughs> story about the ghost gang ever was Tom O'Connor who was still playing his hometown, home city I should say, of Liverpool and they're in the middle of a matinee and they're doing the ghost gang. You will tell me boys and girls if you see the ghost country. Yes, he's behind you. This way? No, no, this way. Go mental I would say. So in the, this particular matinee, for no reason at all, the front three rows of the theatre were taken by a very posh boys school. So they're all doing the yes, he's behind you, and the place is going crazy. And then suddenly there was a silence, and a very posh boy's voice rang out. Don't shout anymore, Charles, the man's obviously an idiot. He said, <laughs> 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 not that stuff. 
me say, really? For nothing. There we are now. But I have to tell you, Panama, that the very best dame I ever worked with in Panama was a man called Jack Tripp. And we did, we did 14 pantomimes together, and he was as quick with the line off as he was on. He did a pantomime one year without me, I might tell you, and with Basil Brush. You know, Ivan Owen was the chap who used to control and own Basil Brush. So they did what we always do on a Monday, you know, you've been away for the weekend, go and have a cup of tea and you're sitting chatting about what you've done on the weekend. So we're all chatting and I went and said, well, listen, this weekend I got home to discover my house had been burgled. And Jack said, oh, really? He said, yes. He said, and the amazing thing was they didn't take a single thing. And Jack said, how humiliating. <laughs> <laughs> taught me so many different routines and there were routines that have been going for hundreds of years and, and Jack taught me these routines and we worked on them together and sort of made them our own and that's the great thing about Panama when people of particularly older performance pass it on to the new ones and Jack learned most of the routines from a very very uh, gay old camp uh, dame called Douglas Bean. Oh. They are there. He, Douglas Bing taught Jack lots and lots of different routines. And I saw Douglas Bing just before he died in Brighton. And he did one of these question and answer afternoons at the Dome in Brighton. And he got there and the place was packed with the entire gay community of Brighton. <laughs> <laughs> the town was empty. You know? <laughs> <laughs> But one of these guys said, uh, excuse me, he said, rather similar to me, he said, excuse me, he said, uh, did you ever, I said to Dougie Bing, did you ever see Lady Beerbohm Tree? And Dougie Bing said, well, yes, as a matter of fact, I did. He said, I saw her once, he said, on a charity concert at the Haymarket Theatre on a Sunday night. He said, she came on in a purple crinoline, he said, with a jeweled diamond tiara, said, diamond necklace, diamond... Earrings, she said, and full length gloves with diamond bracelets around the outside. And she had a purple ostrich feather fan that she carried on and a kitchen chair. <laughs> so she put it in the middle of the stage and said, Now I want you all to imagine I'm a plumber's mate. <laughs> June Whitfield was here. So we were doing Panama at Richmond, you know. And as is our one, we used to have a chat after the show, sit in the dressing room and have the old, you know, pint of draft round your ear and all that. <laughs> we got nothing in it, you know, with that. And we used to chat and everything about what we were doing next. And June said to me one night, said, What are you doing next? I said, Well, I've got another lot of the radio show and use headlines. I said, But we're in trouble now. I said, we just got, our first girl was Janet Brown, who did the marvellous impressions and all that. Then we had Alison Stedman with us for quite a few years. I don't know what happened to her, but there we are. <laughs> and I said, now we're looking for another girl. And I said, we just can't do that anyway. We've tried all sorts of girls in radio, and no one quite fits the bill. And June said, well, I've done a bit of radio, you know. Saucy <laughs> man, you know. It's glum and all that, you see. And me, big time, you know, I said, no, well, this isn't your little scene, you know, see. This is satire, you know. <laughs> no, it's all about politics and things like that, you know. I said, now, if you could do impressions, I said, you might stand a chance. It's saucy bug or whatnot, you know. There we are. So she said, oh, fine, you know. So the next afternoon, she was playing the fairy in the pantomime. And it comes to the fight between the cat and the rat. So she walks out to the middle of the stage and said, Go to your corners, and when you hear the bell, you'll come out fighting. 